It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. This week, the Minister of Energy justified his government's scrapping of clean energy contracts by quoting what he called his favourite periodical, a climate change conspiracy website called Climate Change Dispatch. The minister seems to doubt climate science and is now getting dubious facts from conspiracies he finds online. The minister says he likes to consider quote-unquote both sides of the question. When it comes to the question of whether there is a climate crisis, does the energy minister believe there are two legitimate sides of the coin? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly do believe in climate change, and that's why I'm proud of the fact that Ontario has one of the cleanest energy jurisdictions in the continent, Mr. Speaker. 92% of our energy system is GHG emission-free. And more than 60% of it comes from clean nuclear source, which the NDP do not support, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear that this journey started 18 years ago. Then Premier Harris issued a directive to phase out coal starting at the Lakeview uh, generating station. It took 14 years and other governments to, to complete that journey, Mr. Speaker, but it was a major step in ensuring that Ontario would be, have one of the cleanest energy jurisdictions in, the North, in North America and for the world to marvel, marvel at. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister of Energy. In the face of a major new report that says the world needs to take bold action to tackle the climate crisis, the Ford government rejects the consensus of climate scientists that we're facing a human-caused climate crisis and clings to climate denial websites. The minister couldn't even answer a yes or no question from the media on whether he believes human activity is a significant contributor to climate change. I'd like to give him another chance. Does the minister believe human activity is a significant contributor to climate change? Minister Van It's always interesting, Mr. Speaker, when an official opposition has to use the media to carry the big boxes for them. Isn't it interesting over the past week that they've had to quote big words that they had to check in the dictionary uh, from a Toronto Star reporter or a, a, a headline from the CBC, Mr. Speaker, which was a departure from the facts and the discussion that was had that day, Mr. Speaker. Here's the truth. Ontario leads North America as one of the cleanest, as the cleanest energy jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker. It's because we remain committed to coal phase out Order. in the course of uh, 18 years, Mr. Speaker. It's because we believe in the people in the, in the Durham region who every day go to work as a skilled workforce, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have world-class, safe nuclear energy, Mr. Speaker, to supply almost two-thirds of this province with its energy. We remain committed to those kinds of investments, not projects, Mr. Speaker, that have made our system too complex, non-competitive, and more importantly, for families, seniors, and Indigenous communities across the province. Thank you. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and we all know what it means when a minister won't address the question. Exactly. I think we all know that. Yeah. Denying the climate crisis, a human-caused climate crisis, would certainly explain many of this government's actions. Government ripped up clean energy contracts, costing Ontarians at least $231 million. Spent million more, millions more, on stickers on gas pumps that didn't even stick and fighting a losing court battle against putting a price on pollution. The Ford government would clearly rather rip down windmills and stick up stickers than invest in the clean energy economy of Ontario's future. I'd like to ask a third time, does the minister believe that human-caused climate change is real? Minister of Energy. Climate change is real, Mr. Speaker. There's no dispute about that anywhere in this place. I'm pretty sure of that. The question is, Mr. Speaker, how do we develop a clean, affordable energy uh, system here in Ontario? And here's how we don't do it, Mr. Speaker. In 2015 annual report, the Auditor General concluded that ratepayers paid, wait for it, $37 billion more than necessary from 2006 to 2014. The same hydro rates went up by 22 per cent. She also determined that we'd spend an additional $133 
billion dollars by 2032 due to the global adjustment electricity fees on hydro bills. You want to talk about expensive and how we got there, Mr. Speaker? I'll tell you how we got there. There were votes in this place that Response. made that system the most complex and, and expensive in the system, and that member voted for it every single time, Mr. Speaker. The next question, again, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Well, thank you, Speaker. I guess the answer to my last question was a no. So we'll go to my next. For over a year, the Premier has insisted that scrapping clean energy would lead to a 12 per cent reduction in hydro bills. Now that contracts have been scrapped and the price tag for scrapping them has gone from $0, and I'm sure you remember, Speaker, to $231 million, can the minister tell families when they can expect their bills to go down? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Modern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's, let's be clear on the cost savings from scrapping more than 750 of these projects. $790 million in net present value. Now, Mr. Speaker, that's not accommodating for inflationary rates. That's not accommodating for the fact sure. that this would, in fact, fortify a system, Mr. Speaker, that has become so complex and so expensive, it is, runs the risk of putting Ontario out of business, Mr. Speaker, and families are spending too much more for their energy. We've taken the kinds of ste Response. extraordinary steps, most of them by the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have a path to reduce hydro rates in the province of Ontario, and it's coming soon, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I, I don't think he quite addressed the question there. After one year of the Ford government, hydro bills are higher than they have ever been. In fact, they're climbing. The Ford government's strategy so far has consisted of meddling at Hydro One and tearing up contracts for renewable energy. That's made a lot of money for energy companies, raking in hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation for bungled contracts. But families are still waiting for relief. Speaker, order. Can the minister tell families when they can expect their bills to go down? Minister, Mr. Speaker, it, 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 it just it just occurred to me, Mr. Speaker, that the impact of the increase in hydro rates from 2009 to 2015, which ranged from 5.5 percent every year to 22 percent every year. Fully endorsed by the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, in cahoots with the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, because it wasn't on the bill. You see, they didn't have to hide it. An inflationary rate this past November 1st, we take very seriously, Mr. Speaker, and we've spent the last year making sure that we get rid of the things that, and pressures that have been in our system to make this one of the most complex and expensive there is. But that member, Mr. Speaker, has never had to account for the fact that in November 1st, 2015, he gave a ringing endorsement for a 22 per cent increase in the rate of Ontario. That's the people of Kenora, Mr. Speaker, the people of Thunder Bay, the residents who live in Kuwait, and Mr. Speaker, you name the community, they paid way too much, and he voted. Thank you. The final supplementary. Order. Government side, come to order. <laughs> Government side, come to order. Restart the clock. Member for Toronto Danforth, final supplementary. Yeah, well, thank you, Speaker. I think they're getting a bit touchy on that side. <laughs> Speaker, if the Premier's job was to make energy companies millions of dollars, he's done an amazingly good job. Let's face it, right? The U.S. energy company Avista took home a $103 million cancellation fee when the Premier bungled a deal with them. Renewable energy providers here in Ontario will be paid at least $231 million not to generate electricity. But families aren't getting a break. They're certainly not seeing a 12 per cent reduction in their bills, as was promised. Does the Ford government have any intention of delivering on their promise to reduce hydro bills by 12 per cent? Once again, Minister of Energy, her reply. 
Well, we certainly do, Mr. Speaker, and it started started with a, a, an act that some might have deemed collo colloquial Order. in nature, Mr. Speaker, but it was the Clean Up the Hydro Mess Act, the mess that was created by the previous government and supported 100 percent of the time by the official opposition. Ninety orders. No less than 90 communities across this province, Mr. Speaker, were said that they were unwilling host communities to the Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker. I think that's grounds to repeal that act, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we did. And we scrapped 750 projects that went with it, Mr. Speaker, because they were going to continue to support the most complex and expensive energy system we have, Mr. Speaker. We are finally at a place where we have gotten rid of all the uh, ridiculous things that were built into Response. our energy system, baked into it, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to deliver on a promise to reduce hydro rates for major employers, small businesses, seniors, indigenous Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker, and communities all across our great province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Um, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. On Monday, the Legislature unanimously passed a motion calling on this government to communicate directly to the Premier of Quebec our opposition to Quebec's Bill 21. The Premier is missing, um, has a meeting face-to-face -face with Premier Legault, and there is an expectation from organizations such as the World Sick Organization, the Toronto Board of Rabbis, and the National Council of Canadian Muslims that this government will do what it says it will do and communicate Ontario's concern and opposition to Bill 21 directly to Premier Legault. Yet the Premier is refusing to address this serious violation of basic human rights. Why, Premier? The Deputy Premier. Refer to the Government House Leader. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, uh, I've addressed this on multiple occasions, uh, both yesterday and uh, in a speech uh, to this House. Uh, we've uh, reaffirmed on multiple occasions, both the, the Premier on behalf of the government and the members of this legislature on behalf of all parliamentarians, that a bill like that has no place in the province of Ontario, and we would fight something like that, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would encourage the members opposite to, to continue to do what we're doing, to uh, work towards uh, uh, those things and focus on those things that unify the country and help us uh, do that, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, let's also talk about the other things, like the economy, Mr. Speaker. Let's work to build a better economy, Mr. Speaker. I think, the again, finally, uh, we've been very clear on this, and, uh, and I appreciate the honour for bringing it up, but hopefully we can move on from the politics uh, of this and, and move towards doing what's right for the people of Canada. Supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I think it's important that we acknowledge that this House indeed has stood up and spoke out, but we are still waiting to have the Premier actually address and do what the motion calls on him to do. This meeting is a chance to defend basic human rights in Ontario and across this country, Speaker. The Premier hasn't been shy about standing up for Alberta's equalization payments or his opposition to pharmacare here in the country. Yet when it comes to basic human rights, he suddenly doesn't know where he stands and can't stand up and speak out and say what he needs to. The Premier needs to show leadership on a national stage. Leaders don't sit silent when Order. human rights are at stake. Cabinet ministers stood proudly to announce their support for this motion. The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction even tweeted Order. out a video talking about his support. So why don't any of these cabinet ministers mention that they have no intention of actually doing what the motion says it will do? Mr. Speaker, you know the, the the easy thing would be for me to uh, uh, to to ramp up, and uh, uh, but I'm not going to, Mr. Speaker. Look, these are the communities that uh, that uh, the Minister of Small Business uh, and Trade uh, talked about. Uh, the member for Milton, uh, the member for Eglinton Lawrence, uh, uh, the Education uh, uh, Minister, the member for York Centre. These are all very important communities, not just to the government, but to all members of the House. I remind the honourable member that it was a unanimous unanimous in this parliament, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, on the motion that was brought forward not once, but twice. And the Premier has spoken often about this and has been extraordinarily clear prior to the first motion, prior to the second motion, and since, that a bill like this would have no place in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sports, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Visiting Ontario's museums, art galleries and attra art attractions is a great experience for families 
but it can be very expensive for lower to middle income families. I know within the ministry there are several cultural assets like the Royal Ontario Museum, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the McMichael Gallery, the Royal Botanical Gardens, the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto, Science North in Sudbury, and the Parks Commission in Niagara. It'd be great if the government could make these assets attainable for all Ontario families. Can the minister inform this House how our ministry's assets support lower and middle income families so they can see the incredible works of art and history that this province has to offer? Thank you. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to say thank you to the member from Oakville for that question. I know as a father of, a, of two daughters that are my daughter's age, um, it's really important that we continue to make the arts, the cultural history of our province, our museums and our historic sites accessible and attainable for every family in this wonderful province. Now, he mentioned the AGO, and I'm so very proud of the Art Gallery of Ontario. They offer free admission to all Indigenous people and they offer those 25 years of age and under free admission on every Wednesday evening. In addition, the Royal Ontario Museum, which I believe is one of the best-run museums in the world, offers free admission on the third Tuesday of each month from 5.30 to 8.30. They also offer the Daphne Cockwell Gallery, dedicated to First Peoples and art and culture, free of charge for every Ontarian. Speaker, I often say that we are the Response. world's province. We also have world-class facilities that every Ontario child deserves to see. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. That's uh, wonderful to hear that uh, po very positive news. Speaker, ensuring all families have access to art, arts and culture and all our natural heritage is incredibly important. Since my constituents neither live in Toronto or near any of the other cultural assets, it can sometimes be difficult for them to take part in these free events. In my community, we have the Oakville Museum, which recently told the story of an exhibit, Preserving Peace, Souvenirs of Peacekeeping, Eva Martinez, the first female United Nations observer who spoke about her experience with the UN peacekeeping mission in Guatemala in 1997. The value of learning these experiences such as this are immeasurable and essential to instilling pride in our province and country. Can the minister tell us what she is doing to support local museums like this and help local families access these services? Thank you. Minister. It's a very good question. I'm glad that he was able to tell this House about the wonderful work that they're doing in Oakville at their museum. Again, our, in our ministry, our goal is to build on and grow our spectacular double bottom line. That is a $71 billion economic imprint, but at the same time preserving and protecting our cultural history and our fabric. And we do so within this ministry by investing directly into museums across Ontario to ensure that they continue to operate. But one of the things I'm most excited about, Speaker, that was in the fall economic statement is the fact that we're going to expand the fund pass to all museums and galleries and attractions throughout Ontario so that we can make local museums, local historic site, and local attractions free for children. We'll have more details in the months ahead, Speaker, but this is, I think, one of the most exciting things this government can be doing to make sure that we are offering the entire world in one province to every child that lives in our great communities. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Education. Elementary and secondary teachers are continuing job actions today, standing firm in defense of our public education system and against this government's cuts. Teachers are standing up for students and their right to learn in a classroom that isn't bursting at the seams. They're standing up for parents who don't want their kids left to fend for themselves with risky online courses or to fall through the cracks as 10,000 caring adults and countless supports disappear from our schools, Mr. Speaker. As negotiations drag on, could the minister update the House on the status of those negotiations? Questions addressed to the Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. It is the position of this government that we want a deal, not a strike, to keep the children of this province in class. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, this week we're meeting with OSSTF, with ETFO, as well as with uh, all teacher unions over the coming seven days. But the three major unions will be met with this week as part of our plan to negotiate in good faith to provide predictability for parents. What is regrettable through this experience, Mr. Speaker, is that irrespective of government and premier and party, the one constant through this process every three years is that unions choose to escalate. And my message to them, and I hope the member opposite would agree with this premise, to seize from escalation, to stand with parents, to stay at the table, and let's get a deal that keeps the children of this province in class. 
The supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly the kind of demonization of the workers that we expect from this government, and it is not helpful. No. The reason there's no Order. progress at the bargaining table is because there's been no real moves by the minister to stop his cuts. Only this government would try to spin eliminating 10,000 jobs to eliminating 6,000 jobs uh, and massively increasing class sizes as some kind of reasonable move. By now, it should be pretty darn clear to this minister and this government that Ontarians don't support the elimination of those jobs. They don't support mandatory online learning, replacing in-person instruction, and they don't, support re uh, they don't support trading their children's education for short-term savings. Will Question. the minister listen, get back to work, stop the spin, and reverse these terrible cuts to our classrooms? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I make clear, the Premier and this entire government is committed to getting a resolution, as we did with QP, that provides predictability for the families and the children of this province. However, what it's telling Mr. Speaker is when given the opportunity to affirm her support with parents against escalation, she and the leader of the New Democrats have said nothing. And that abdication of opportunity, of responsibility to say with clarity that they oppose escalation, they oppose Order. their children being out of class or, more importantly, having steps being taken under mind their education is in fact quite telling and regrettable. My position, the position of every member of this team, is to keep children in class through negotiated settlements that are good for teachers, good for students, and good for parents in this province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Earlier this month, the minister delivered our government's fall economic statement and with it our plan to build Ontario together. The minister outlined a plan to li make life more affordable for Ontarians across the province. It's a plan that also recognizes the unique challenges and opportunities in Northern Ontario. Could the minister please inform the House about the steps our government is taking to make life more affordable for families and individuals living in the North? Good question. Questions to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from uh, from Kitchener Conestoga. Of course, he he represents his members well and his or his uh, his constituents well. But of course, he also uh, grew up in the north, and so he appreciates the unique challenges that uh, and opportunities that uh, that face uh, face our citizens in the north. We understand that as a government, Mr. Speaker. That is why, in our fall economic statement, we have put forward the uh, proposal to reduce the cost of living in the north by reducing the cost of aviation fuel, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Reducing a tax from 6.7 cents to 2.7 cents. And Mr. Speaker, what does that mean? I often talk about affordability not as grandiose gestures, but tangible actions. That means reducing the cost of groceries for a family of four by $230, Mr. Speaker, a year, or reducing the cost of air travel by $135. And I'd ask, Mr. Speaker, our colleagues in the opposition, where the North is so well represented, how they plan to vote. I know they voted twice against reducing the cost of living in the North, but how they plan to vote when this comes for a final vote in this legislature. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. The proposed aviation fuel tax cut makes it abundantly clear that this is a government committed to supporting Northern Ontario. Our government is dedicated to making life more affordable for Ontarians across the province. No matter where you live, we want to put more money in your pocket and make it easier for families and individuals. Could the minister please inform the House about what other steps this government is taking to improve affordability? Mr. Finance. And I, thank, I thank the member for the question. So the aviation fuel tax will reduction will reduce the cost of living in Thunder Bay and Timmins and Sudbury across the north. And that's important. And again, I ask the members across the, uh, the legislature to think about that. But Mr. Speaker, that's not all this government has done. We've also introduced our low income tax credit, Mr. Speaker. That 1.1 million Ontarians that will see a reduction in their costs and, uh, and in fact eliminate 580,000 Ontarians who make minimum wage from the tax rolls. Our low, our, uh, our low income child care tax credit mr speaker that targets the most the families most in need and will reduce costs by an average of $1200 mr speaker for those families in child care these are the specific actions we're taking again not grandiose statements about making life affordable but specific actions we're taking to make life more affordable Order. and i join all our colleagues Response. in the house to support these sure. kinds of important the next question the member for Tomiskaming Cochrane thank you speaker my question is to the premier Today's Global Mail reports that Bill Blair, or Brad Blair, 
excuse me, the decorated police veteran who was fired as acting OPP commissioner when he blew the whistle on the Premier's attempts to hire his friend, has launched a constitutional challenge against the government, specifically against Bill 100, the government's blatant attempt to place itself above the law and to make the Premier immune from lawsuits. Does the Ford government truly believe that their legislation is justifiable and constitutional? The Deputy Premier. The Attorney General. Referred to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and it, it's interesting because I know all members of the House understand the rules and how things work. And, and to ask me about a question that is in the courts is very difficult for me to respond. So, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the member's second question, which, which perhaps uh, I can act, actually deal Order. with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. <laughs> That actually was the point of the question, but if the, if the Ford government genuinely thought this legislation was defensible, they wouldn't have buried it in an omnibus bill and rammed it through with only two days of hearings. The former commissioner wasn't afraid to blow the whistle when the premier tried to appoint his friend as OPP commissioner, or when the premier asked him to buy a van and keep it off the books. And he's not afraid to take on the Ford government now. Brad Blair shouldn't have to take this government to do the right thing. So a question that the Attorney General can answer is how much money is the government willing to waste to drag this through the courts? Again, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I missed, I missed the member from Essex on these kinds of questions, Mr. Speaker. Because you wouldn't even ask it. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, Again, it's a matter of litigation. I can't address matters of litigation in front uh, when they're when they're in proceeding, Mr. Speaker. So, so I, I would love to have a dialogue, perhaps when when litigation is completed about whatever the process was or whatever the perceived difficulties is the member has. But uh, for the moment, Mr. Speaker, as a matter of litigation, I can't respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, human trafficking is a serious issue happening across the globe and across our province. This summer, the minister visited my riding of Niagara West and held a roundtable with those impacted by human trafficking in our region, where it is a serious problem. It was shocking for me to hear about the realities of human trafficking in our province and especially the realities uh, of human trafficking happening in our local communities. Speaker, did you know that the average age for recruitment is only 13 wow. years old? And over 70% of human trafficking victims identified by police are under the age of 25. It is disgusting and completely unacceptable. Could the minister tell the House what she's doing to uh, stop human trafficking in our province? Associate Minister for Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Niagara West for the important question. First, I would like to thank and acknowledge the Minister of Infrastructure for all her advocacy on this file for the past five years. Her knowledge and activism have helped me personally as our government works to build a comprehensive anti-human trafficking strategy. Speaker, the member is right. Human trafficking is a crisis that is happening across the province, in all of our communities, and at all levels of society. Victims are being lured by perpetrators who rob them of their safety and dignity and profit from their abuse. That is why this morning our government announced that we are committing to $20 million per year to support survivors and combat human trafficking. This is a first step as we develop Response. a comprehensive anti-human trafficking strategy. Our goal is that everyone in this province can live safely and free from the threat, fear, or experience of exploitation and violence. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I would like to thank the Minister for her response and investment in such an important issue in our province. I'd also like to congratulate the Minister and the Solicitor General on co-developing, working together to build a new, stronger cross-government strategy to raise awareness of these horrific crimes and ensure survivors get the supports they need and that we hold offenders accountable. It's so important to have a cross-government work. Human trafficking impacts so many aspects of a survivor's life, and this requires wraparound services. I know 
know at the roundtable that we did hold earlier this year, we heard from survivors who've been supported by local community organizations in my writing, like Jillian's Place, uh, the Niagara Sexual Assault Centre, uh, even the Niagara Falls Firefighters, but there's so much more to be done. So could the minister tell the House uh, exactly what this funding is for and what exactly our government is doing to support those who've been impacted by human trafficking? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the member for that question. The funding announced this morning is part of a range of investments we have made to combat human trafficking, prevent and end violence against women, and support victims of sexual violence and exploitation and end gang-related activity. This announcement is a signal that we are taking immediate action on what we had heard from stakeholders in our human trafficking roundtables discussions this summer, that there was a need for consistent and reliable funding. This funding includes supports for culturally relevant services and care designed by and for Indigenous peoples within Ontario. It also includes support for projects that offer wraparound services to those being human trafficked and increased protection for people at risk of being trafficked. As we continue to develop the new anti -tra human trafficking strategy, we all need to work together. This means working across sectors, across jurisdictions and across the aisle. So we can raise awareness, help survivors, and hold. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of the Environment shifted blame from his ministry and denied any responsibility for informing Hamiltonians of a massive sewage spill. His own ministry has been investigating for some time. The ministry's own officials have known of the spill since the spring of 2018, if not earlier than that. And yet his ministry chose not to tell Hamiltonians or their watershed neighbours like Burlington. They didn't tell them about what the potential for ca contamination could mean for the health of citizens and for our environment. So to the minister, if Hamilton has, quote, failed its citizens, what does it say about this government that knew about the, uh, this bill and said basically, oh well, not my job to tell anyone? Deputy Premier, referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, member opposite. And, and listen, um, we've been working with the public health down there, the municipality, Conservation Authority, to deal with this issue. But you know, under the current system, the onus of municipalities local health authorities and conservation authorities is to notify the public of these health and safety matters. While the city complied with the intent of the ministry orders, we think more should have been done to fulfill the responsibility. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to take action on that as part of our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, which is a year old tomorrow, this, uh, this plan which continues to evolve and make Ontario a better place to live. We're going to uh, transfer into a system that delivers online notification to people living across Ontario so that any sewage spills, any events such as that going on, they'll be able to go online and get real-time data to ensure that they're informed of what's going on. Again, I reiterate, the, the Council of Hamilton, Response. the City Council of Hamilton, let their people down, and hopefully they learn from their errors and move on and become more open and transparent to the people of Hamilton. A supplementary question. Well, that's all well and good, but I believe the ministry has the discretion to make sure that Hamiltonians were informed, and you chose not to use that discretionary power. And obviously, Ontarians deserve transparency when it comes to, to contamination of our ecosystems, especially when that contamination could affect our water supply. Families walk their dogs by rivers and creeks, and they let their kids play in ponds. They deserve to know what could be lurking. We now know the Ministry of the Environment has known about the massive sewage spill for some time in Hamilton. So my question again to the minister, the people of Hamilton and the people of Ontario deserve to know what's in our water. How many other spills and leaks is the ministry currently waiting for someone else to report? Minister reply. Well, thanks again for the uh Question, Mr. Speaker, and you know, other jurisdictions are informing the, their people if there's spillage of sewage or not. Unfortunately, the city of Hamilton decided not to fully uh, be uh, open to the people of the, of the city of Hamilton, and that's unfortunate. That, that council failed its residents. But, Mr. Speaker, whether or not the member opposite wants to uh, uh, make up certain rules and regulations, the onus today is to report 
the, uh, any type of system on the municipalities. We are working as the Ministry of Environment to ensure that the cleanup is happening and the water and the resources are returned to its best state possible, Mr. Speaker. We are making changes to the system for an online, real-time data available to all residents of Ontario for any source of sewage uh, contamination. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to work and ensure that system is up Spons. and going. Our main environmental plan will start dealing with wastewater treatment, Mr. Speaker. We are going to make Ontario a better place to live as we protect our land, air and sea and make a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the government house leader. Yesterday, the government house leader introduced a package of changes to the standing orders. The NDP claimed that these proposed changes, changes will allow our government, and I quote, to ram through re uh, legislation and pass a bill in a single day. Would the government house leader please explain if the proposed changes to the standing orders really limit debate as the NDP claimed? Thank you. Uh, Recognize the government house leader. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let me just uh, uh, congratulate the member for Kitchener Conestoga. He has been a wealth of knowledge over the over the summer as we've been consulting on uh, on potential changes to the uh, standing orders. He has been a, a very fierce advocate for improving debate and the ability for members across uh, the aisle to, uh, to engage in more fulsome debate. So I thank him for that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me assure the member, because I know the member. Uh, this is important to the member, but let me assure the member and all members of the House that, in fact, the changes that are being proposed to the standing orders, in no way impact or allow this government have given this government more tools to pass a bill uh, in one day. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we've added the following standing order 47D, which says a bill and a time allocation motion applying to that same bill may not be considered on the same day. We, of course, have not removed the ability for Response. the opposition to provide reasoned amendments, would, uh, which would also allow them uh, to delay uh, uh, the passage of legislation, Mr. Speaker. So uh, part of the problem, I suspect, is that the NDP withdrew from the process and maybe— Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to uh, the government House Leader uh, for those kind words and, of course, clearing up what we're here to talk about today. Mr. Speaker, if the NDP had indicated that they did not want to support the proposed changes, I assume that that would also mean, Mr. Speaker, that they don't support the accommodation of members with disabilities, and I find that quite outstanding. Order. Would the government House Leader Order. please explain what consultation process went into these proposals, Mr. Speaker? Government House Leader. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. The member raises a very important point because early on in the process, we, we made a lot of discuss We had talked a lot about what standing orders uh, uh, we could use to modernize. Now, Mr. Speaker, we, in, in the standing order changes, we did make a, a proposal that uh, members with disability would not have to ask for unanimous consent uh, in order to participate in the daily uh, operations of the House. We made some changes with respect to cell phones and laptops. I'm sure if you look around the chamber, most members have laptops and phones on, the, on, their, on their, their desks. We reached out, of course, in early October and said to the opposition, what are the things that we can agree upon? Let's put those on the table. Let's pass those like that I was talking about with respect to members with disabilities. And let's pass that and let's debate the rest of it. The NDP chose at that point to withdraw from the discussions, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, I do. I am encouraged that uh, both uh, the, uh, the Liberal Party and the Green Party have continued to participate, and I think the standing orders will reflect improved opportunity for data across both sides of the House, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Muskegawak, James Bay. I'll send that super. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Northern Ontario, and once again, the province response was to close Highway 11 and 17. Once again, Northern Ontario families were cut off, and once again, the movement of goods throughout Northern Ontario came to a halt. The, gov the government officially treats Highway 11 and 17 in Northern Ontario as class two, literally second class, Mr. Speaker. This means the province thinks it's okay that Northern Ontario drivers must wait longer for their highways to be cleared. Why does this Premier think Northern Ontario families deserve second class safety and services? Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. To the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to rise in the House to answer this question yet again. And I will do it every single day because I'm sure every day in the North it will snow. Yeah. And the Ministry of Transportation Order. will work closely 
with the OPP to make sure that we are taking steps to ensure the safety of our motorists in the north. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite would not want to make, would not want to subject our motorists to unsafe driving conditions because that's what we work on and that's what we're focused on at the Ministry of Transportation. Here, here. And I'm happy to report, as I have already in this House, that we exceed our safety standards and our snow plowing standards on Highway 11 and Highway 17. They exceed the standards that we expect for our Class 1 highways. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, to find ways to exceed those standards and to continue to do better, because on this side of the House, we are focused on the safety of the motorists of the North. Supplementary question. Merci, mais... Thank you. The answer is no, Madam Minister. It's more plows. Earlier this month, this government voted down my bill to apply the same snow clearance standard to Northern Highways 11 and 17 as the 400 series highways in the south. The government voted to keep Northern Ontario as second class. The member of Nipissing said second class status for the North was fine by him. This week, Northern Ontario families are seeing this second class status for themselves with repeated highway closures. The answer to snow is not to close northern highways. The answer is to run more plows. Will the Premier listen to northern Ontario families and stop sec this second-class treatment? Members, please take your seats. And the Minister of Transportation again to report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very pleased to say that our government has taken concrete steps to improve the lives of people living in Northern Ontario. But instead of supporting our initiatives that help the people living in Northern Ontario, the NDP decided to vote against it and play politics. In this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, our government reaffirmed our commitment. The four-laning of Highway 69 and Highway 11 and 17 in the north, including stretches between Kenora and the Manitoba border, the creation of a mining work Working group, Mr. Speaker, that's going to focus on attracting investment to Northern Ontario. The opposition voted against those initiatives, oh, Mr. Speaker. Order. But that's not just it, Mr. Speaker. They vote, they're voting against the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program. They're voting against Order. the Child Care Tax Credit, Response. and they're voting against the Low Income Individuals and Families Tax Credit. Mr. Speaker, they're also voting against the Aviation Fuel Tax Credit. Shame. Mr. Speaker. That will make the life. Thank of you. Living. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. My question is for our province's first Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Yeah. Speaker, mental health and addictions affect people and families in all of our communities across this great province each and every year. No matter where in Ontario, we know that each year, two and a half million Ontarians that's one in five, Mr. Speaker, will experience a mental health or addictions challenge. And for many living in northern Ontario, especially those in our Indigenous communities, there is next to no mental health and addiction support. I know that our government recognizes, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, that we must do more. Would the minister please explain what this government is doing to address mental health and addictions in northern Ontario? Great. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Willowdale for his uh, excellent and important question. Mr. Speaker, I recently traveled throughout Northern Ontario, visiting many of the remote communities that provided me with an understanding of the mental health and addictions challenges faced by many Ontarians living in rural and remote communities each and every day. Mr. Speaker, my travels took me from Thunder Bay to Sioux Lookout 
and all the way to remote Indigenous communities such as Pakanjakum and Sandy Lake. During my travels, I met with a number of Indigenous leaders, community organizations, and first responders who continue to work with populations who were continually neglected by previous governments. I heard from the people with lived experience in these communities, and our government remains committed to taking real action Spons. to ensure that the Ontarians in the North receive access to high-quality mental health and addiction services where and when they need them. The supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I am proud to stand here in this legislature knowing that our government is making mental health and addictions a top priority. Yeah. I'm also proud that our government is continuing to deliver real action to address the mental health and addictions crisis in Northern Ontario. I'm also pleased to hear that the Minister has taken the time to meet with Indigenous partners and frontline workers throughout the North. I know that these first-hand experiences will inform much of the work that we are doing to address the gaps in our mental health and addiction system. Speaker, would the Minister please provide this House with more detail on the mental health and addiction supports being provided for those incredible citizens in Northern Ontario. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for that question. Since the very beginning, our government has remained committed to investing $3.8 billion over 10 years to build a comprehensive, connected and integrated mental health and addiction system underpinned by our mental health and addiction strategy that we look forward to unveiling in the coming months. Our government will continue working hard to ensure that Ontarians in the North are able to access quality mental health and addiction services no matter where they live in the province. On top of the $19.9 million we have invested in consumption and treatment service sites this year, we will also make investments in the North that will generate positive impacts in Northern communities. This year, we have invested over $33 million in opioid Response. addiction treatment services funding that has and will continue to go to service providers in regions across Northern Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today in St. Catharines, I have a resident, Jared Wayland, who suffers from spinal muscular atrophy a degenerative disease that requires a drug called Spinraza. Jared is over 18 years old, which means he has to cover the full cost of the life-saving drug. He simply cannot afford to pay upwards of $700,000 per dose. Back in June, the health minister committed to reviewing coverage on a case-by-case -case basis through the Exceptional Access Program for people who are too old for automatic coverage. However, despite full of all requirements for the exceptional coverage, Jared has been waiting for months to hear back from the ministry. Does the Premier think it is fair to make young people like Jared hope and pray they'll receive approval of this because of an arbitrary age restriction established by this government? Deputy Premier. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and I'm sorry that Jared has been waiting so long to find out about his uh, the availability of Spinraza under the Exceptional Access Program. I would be happy to t speak with you um, privately about this to understand more about the details, and I would certainly follow up with the ministry to try and get an answer for him as soon as possible. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank, that, thank you for that response. However, Jared is 31 years old, and he's, whose life expectancy is cut short because he cannot afford this medication he needs, and you know this. However, the Minister of Health knows this because I sent her a letter in June, and then another one in August, and I only received a letter late in October after reminding the Health Minister in person, but her response still did not include an actual answer for the dying man. Just earlier this week, the Premier gave the excuse that nearly all Ontarians have drug coverage for his reason to oppose pharmacare. Will the Premier admit that he was wrong 
and immediately commit to coverage, covering Jared's drug treatment today. Right on. Again, Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Again, thank you for the question, but as the member will know, we have to make evidence-based decisions uh, with respect to drugs, with respect to any kind of coverage. The indications that we have right now is Spinraza is particularly effective for people of a younger age, but as I have indicated to you, I am certainly very happy to look specifically into Jared's case and to discuss that with you in greater detail. So thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Flooding is having an increased impact on the people of Ontario and our communities. In both 2017 and 2019, we experienced widespread flooding during the spring freshet. As a result, there are ongoing concerns about the situation, especially in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. This summer, you appointed Doug McNeil as special advisor to examine Ontario's flood preparedness in response to this year's floods. The special advisor's report has been made public this morning, and I look forward to studying it closely. Can the minister tell the people of Perry Sound, Muskoka, and other areas that experienced flooding this year about what steps are being taken by our government? The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank, you, I thank uh, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka for the question, and I want to thank him for his hard work during the floods during the spring as well. I want to thank uh, Mr. McNeil for his hard work on the report as the Special Advisor, as well as the Premier for his leadership on this file. As I announced this morning, Mr. McNeil's independent report on Ontario's flood response found that the actions taken by our government and our partners in water management have been effective in reducing and mitigating the risks posed by flooding. However, we know that there is always more that can be done so that Ontario is better prepared for future events. The Special Advisor's report contains recommendations on how we can improve flood management in Ontario, and I look forward to speaking to more of the specifics of the recommendations in the supplemental. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The number one priority for any government needs to be public safety and the protection of people and property. I do want to thank Mr. McNeil for his work on this report. I was impressed with his knowledge and expertise when I attended his meeting with municipal leaders in Muskoka. Can the minister tell us the nature of the recommendations in the report and what actions the government will be taking to increase Ontario's resiliency for future flood events? Question. Sir? Well, I thank the member for his supplemental as well, Speaker. As I said earlier, the Special Advisor's report makes recommendations on improving Ontario's flood management. Our government is committed to addressing these recommendations by updating policies, regulations and guidelines to protect people and property, as well as continuing to invest over $4.7 million in infrastructure for flood forecasting and warnings. Last week, the Premier sent a letter to Prime Minister Trudeau asking the International Joint Commission to appoint a member to the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board from Ontario, someone chosen by the province to represent the region impacted by record high water levels. It is imperative that communities most impacted by the decisions made by the IJC are represented at the table. Thank you very much, Speaker. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Good, good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Kachuguma, uh, the Premier. The Matawa Chiefs Council came to Queen's Park this week to address the concerns they had with Bill 32 at committee. They stated that it was inappropriate for Ontario to address inherent Aboriginal and treaty rights within the schedule of the Red Tape Reduction Bill. The Chiefs Council came here to speak to Ontario, not just as partners, but as investors of certainty that is required for anyone to do business in the North. Mr. Speaker, why does this government not understand the financial impact of not properly partnering with First Nations? Excellent. Deputy Premier. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for his question. Of course, the Better, uh, Better for People, Smarter for Business Act 2019 provides certainty 
to the mining sector. The proposed amendments to the Mining Act hold the government to make a decision about filing uh, or returning a closure plan amendment uh, to 45 days. But, Mr. Speaker, there are no impacts to treaty and Aboriginal rights as a result of these pro proposed changes. All consultation, importantly, needs to be completed up front with the consultation report before any certified closure plan is received. Mr. Speaker, we take our duty to consult and accommodate, more importantly, build relationships with the Matawa communities, like the $30 million investment into their broadband, Mr. Speaker, so to ensure that they have an information highway, hopefully Plus. a corridor to prosperity and a better life overall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Ontario's North has the potential to be the next economic engine of the country, but any development in what Ontario calls the far north cannot and will not be imposed without the consent of First Nations. The, uh, the omnibus bill legislation, Bill 132, is being fast-tracked by this government without giving First Nations an appropriate engagement mechanism in time to respond. Will the government remove Schedules 8 and 16 from the bill and establish a respectful yes. process for engagement with First Nations, yes or no? Yes. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's important to understand the history of the Far North Act. No one should dispute on either side of this floor, uh, Mr. Speaker, that that Far North Act lacked any any consultation or accommodation for the Indigenous communities in the far north. I happen to be living up in those communities when that act was being shoved down their throats, Mr. Speaker. The only piece of it that was salvageable was land use planning, Mr. Speaker, and we intend and we continue to support the communities in those important activities because they will have a say, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, is that I just had a conversation with Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler, Mr. Speaker, who's looking forward to an important dialogue moving forward, Mr. Speaker, that will transform the opportunity for those communities in the North. But while I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the member opposite. When it comes to voting Order. against the av aviation fuel Response. tax, Mr. Speaker, why did he say no to something that would, in actual dollars, reduce the cost of food transportation in and out of the isolated communities in his Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is again for the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. As I mentioned earlier, the minister attended a human trafficking roundtable in my riding this summer, and I'm proud to say that we had wonderful turnout from organizations across the region. Uh, out of the 13 that were held, I understand we had the most participants. We even had firefighters speaking about their experience working with victims and survivors. And it's so unfortunate that human trafficking occurs and impacts so many areas of life, but it is also so encouraging to see that many different sectors are taking this seriously and providing train of training so that they can be supportive, understanding and helping those who need it most. So could the minister expand on the role of the stakeholders and how they've played such an important role in developing our anti-human trafficking work, what she heard at our roundtables across the province and how this has informed the announcement this morning? The Associate Minister of Women's and Children's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Speaker, I want to thank all stakeholders for participating in these roundtables. I was privileged to meet with survivors, law enforcement officers, Indigenous partners like Ontario Native Women's Association, who is in the gallery today and who I'll be meeting with later, and also other frontline workers. It is the, workers of part, so the work of partners like ONWA that encouraged us to act on today's announcement. And it is through collaborative work that the Solicitor General and I will be developing a comprehensive anti-human trafficking strategy. I want to thank Coralie mcguire Syreet from Ontario Native Women's Association for her supportive uh, quote today. The Ontario Native Women's Association is pleased that the Ontario government has renewed and expanded on their commitment to end human trafficking. Bonds. This is a significant step honouring the voices and expertise of Indigenous survivors who have bravely shared their stories to create programming services that meets the needs of Indigenous women and children. Yeah, yeah. Very much. Supplementary question. Very much, Speaker. My question
question is back to the Associate Minister uh, of, of Women's Issues. This is such an important subject, and it's one that I know so many of us across party lines have heard from uh, constituents and have heard from people in our communities about, but it's often a hidden problem. It's one that we might not know about, we might not hear about until it impacts someone very close to us. I know prior to uh, getting into elected office, I did not know much about human trafficking, and I was unaware of just how much of it occurs also in the Niagara region. And so, as our eyes are open, the call to action becomes stronger. And I'm so proud that this government, with the leadership of Premier Ford and our whole team, has shown dedication towards this issue. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Minister of Infrastructure in this regard. But I think it's so important that the announcement this morning uh, be the first step towards many, many more, much more work that needs to be done in this area. So could the minister explain as to how this announcement came to be and what the steps are going to be moving forward? Thank you. <laughs> minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member, again for your question. And thank you for hosting a roundtable in your riding. The roundtable we held in Niagara Falls was the last of 13 roundtables that we did, and I thank all those stakeholders who came out and shared their valuable information, those with lived experience, those working on the front lines, those in the community safety sector. We were in Thunder Bay, Niagara, Barrie, Burlington, just to name a few. I've also met with Violence Against Women coordinating committees and shelters across the province to hear firsthand from those working with victims of human trafficking. I'd like to thank all of those with lived experience who shared that experience with us in moving forward as we develop our anti-human trafficking uh, program. As the member said, it's often unreported cases. Response. Two thirds of the cases happening in Canada happen right here at home in our own communities. It's very important that we're supporting victims, but that we're also educating the public to have eyes. Next question, the member for Timmins. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. My colleague from uh, St. Paul's earlier this week asked the question in regards to the closure of the Tranquility House, the women's shelter that was in Matheson and my colleagues riding. As a result of that closure, capacity has increased as far as the number of women seeking beds in the shelters, both in his communities and in the city of Timmins. We need to get you to transfer the money that used to go to shelters, that provided the dollars in order to be able to provide services to the women who enter those shelters. Will you make sure that the money that used to be used in order to fund the services at Tranquility House in Matheson be transferred to the other centres so that they can deal with the overcapacity? We are now running at 130 per cent in Timmins at the women's centres, both Question. at Boston End and also at the women's shelter. Will you do that? The question is addressed to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Service. The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Refer to the Minister, Associate Minister of Women's and Children's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for your question. The safety and security of all Ontarians is a top priority, and I will work to meet with you as well as your shelter on how we can do better in those areas. Our government is investing in violence prevention and community services that support women and their dependents. This year, the ministry is investing more than $166 million in supports for survivors of violence prevention initiatives. This includes more than $8.7 million in supports for areas. We remain committed to combating against violence of women in all of its forms. I look forward to meeting with the member and discussing the situation in your riding. Thank you. That concludes our question period for today. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 74 relating to allocation of time on Bill 118, an act to amend, an act to enact rather, Mental Health and Addictions Center of Excellence Act 2019 and the Opioid Damages and Health Cost Recovery Act 2019. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. <coughs>
Going to ask the members to please take their seats. On November the 28th, 2019, Mr. Calandra moved Government Notice of Motion No. 74 relating to allocation of time on Bill 116. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willard. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanny Gasly. Mr. Tanny Gasly. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Karahalios. Mrs. Karahalios. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Satley. Ms. Satley. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwen. Mr. Borgwen. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 59, the nays are 34. The ayes being 59 and the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. House stands in recess until 1 p.m.